in at number 10, we have satin screaming poles. These sound well and truly spine chilling. These sounds rival anything a space horror composer could score, and these are natural sounds from Saturn's poles. These are recorded by NASA's Cassini spacecraft in 2002, and they're radio waves that come from Saturn's aurora, so very similar to the light phenomenon at our aurora borealis on Earth. So imagine the swirling green, pinks, and yellow lights accompanying these sounds, which have been sped up with a slight frequency adjust so our human ears can hear them. The sound comes from one of my favorite YouTube channels, Space Audio. They were uploaded in March 2015. Now, Cassini completed its space mission in 2017, losing contact as it made a suicide dive into the planet's atmosphere on September 15th. Number 9, we have Earth's hiss. Wait, the Earth hissed as a spacecraft flew by? Yeah, it, it did. The recording sounds like a huge breathing dragon. Have a listen. How is that anything other than the rise and fall of breath? It kind of sounds like Darth Vader. Apparently, this is sound recorded in 1996 from NASA's polar mission. It's a sound of hot ionized particles generated by sunlight crashing into the atmosphere. It creates a sound like the Earth hissing at us, and to be honest, what with climate change and the rising greenhouse gases, I can understand why the Earth may be pissed enough to hiss. This isn't the first hiss heard from planet Earth by the patient ears of NASA. In 2015, a NASA student balloon experiment using infrared microphones picked up the unsettling sounds from 22 miles above the Earth's surface in New Mexico and Arizona. Coming in at number 8, we have music from the dark side of the moon. It was nothing compared to Pink Floyd, it was kind of A medium pitched wooing isn't everyone's kind of music, but you know what? Each to their own. The astronauts on the Apollo 10 mission and passed around the moon, and when they were the farthest side away from Earth, the dark side, they lost all radio contact with ground control and the rest of us Earthlings. As Apollo careered around the moon, they heard some very weird sounds, like really, really weird sounds. So weird that the astronauts talked about it constantly. The weird sounds were not reported at the time, but they were recorded and received by NASA when the mission returned to Earth. The recordings were then classified, which means that they were being safeguarded from human ears. Why? We're not sure. In 2008, the newly declassified recordings were found, and we can hear the weird woo noises for ourselves. Have a listen. And it means it even sounds outer spacey, doesn't it? Do you hear that? That whistling sound? Yeah. Woo! The astronauts are talking about it constantly, and NASA hasn't really returned to the moon since the 70s, and I'm wondering, you know what? Is it because of these weird noises? Conspiracy. Coming in at number 7, we have the mysterious radio signals from deep space. For the last decade, scientists have been picking up unexplained radio signals they call fast radio bursts from deep space. In fact, on the day I scripted this video, August 7th, 2018, more signals were reported. Now, these signals have ranged in frequency, but the most recent are 580 megahertz, that's 200 lower than previously heard. The latest sounds detected come from very, very far away, possibly billions of light years away. Now the radio signals you're about to hear aren't the most recent, but they are pretty unsettling, especially when the thudding kicks in. Just listen. Okay, and then there's some more. It sounds like maybe the plucking of a string, maybe? Currently, scientists don't know where exactly the sounds are coming from, but they are trying to pinpoint them. Coming into number six, we have Jupiter's crying lightning. The official term for Jupiter's dissonant space words is Jovian whistles. These are descending and ascending sounds created by lightning strikes in the atmosphere. As you may know, Jupiter is a decidedly stormy planet, with its red eye being a giant storm that has raged non-stop for over 350 years. Jupiter 
Sir, you stormy old babe. But I mean, let's have a listen to these terrifying shrieks. It's kind of like a schwam, tram sound, and it kind of sounds like something being launched, like shoom, shoom. What is this about? It's the weirdest lightning I've honestly ever heard. I don't think you can actually hear lightning on Earth. Maybe. This sound was recorded by Jupiter's Voyager in the 70s, so they're around 40 years old. Now the planet is likely still screaming in its stormy areas and has been for hundreds of years. Can you even imagine? Coming into number five, we have Ganymede's ghoulish shrieks. Honestly, I feel like Jupiter's moon Ganymede is trying hard to tell us something here. One of Jupiter's 16 moons, Ganymede, is officially the biggest moon in our solar system with a radius of 2,634 kilometers. This makes her bigger than both Mercury and Pluto, and two thirds the size of Mars. Hey there, big moon, what are you doing? This big moon has its own magnetosphere, which creates some big noises, and they're pretty unsettling. The sounds were recorded in 1996 by the Galileo spacecraft. The initial approach into the magnetosphere is punctuated by strong bursts of noises. Then comes some stranger computer beeping like sounds. Have a little listen. <laughs> Right? Then through the beeps comes windy sounding whirs, then the whole thing crescendos with beeps interspersed with what sounds like alien cries. Tell me what you think. <laughs> Right? Coming into number four, we have the screams of a dying star. So it turns out that stars have feelings too, and why shouldn't they? They're much bigger than us, and we're actually kind of like teeny weeny blips, like atoms compared to a star, or even smaller. In 2012, scientists at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center released an artist's impression of a black hole swallowing a screaming star. The real life star was spotted falling into a huge black hole 3.9 billion light years away in the constellation of Draco. It seems as the stars get sucked in, they release blips of light every 200 seconds, which NASA thinks are like screams. As the star is so far away, we haven't got an actual sound recording that the star made. Scientists say that the frequency of the light, if converted to the sound, would sound like a very low D sharp. NASA buffs can predict what this sound is like based on the oscillations that have been observed by smaller matter falling into smaller black holes in our galaxy, the Milky Way. Coming into number three, we have a creepy singing comet. In 2014, scientists recorded a strange whirring, almost alien like sounding noises. The clicking, vibrating sounds get even higher in frequency and sound very much like I would imagine an alien trying to communicate with us sounds. The Rosetta Orbiter picked up the sounds from the 67P CG comet in August 2014. Have a little listen. So I don't know what is going on, but neither does head researcher Karl Heinz Gleismeister, whose team was baffled by the noise. The European Space Agency think that the sounds must be coming as a result of a process of oscillation from the comet in orbit. I'm still so confused as to why scientists always give space objects such sterile names like 67 PCG. You really missed a trick here. Anyway, what do you make to these sounds and the singing comet? Coming in at number two, we have the heartbeat of a black hole. So this is a thing apparently and actually I'm terrified. I thought the black holes were where things went to die, but it turns out that they may have a little soul going on in there. While we can't directly see or hear what black holes are like, we can see and hear what they do to their environment. In 2008, an MIT professor, Edward Morgan, translated X-ray data from the star system, GRS 1915-105. He then turned it into sound. Now the binary star system is a black hole and a star that feeds into it, and this is what it sounds like. So kind of like a heartbeat. The beating of a deep, dark, all-consuming black heart. How romantic and seriously twisted. Okay, finally, I am pretty sure that listening to this will actually send you mad, like bonkers never be the same again mad. I was listening to this with earphones while researching this video and I had to take them off because it sounded like there was a drill going through my brain. Coming into number one, we have echoes from Titan. Titan is one of Saturn's moons. The sounds you're supposed to hear right now were recorded from Hygens, an atmospheric entry probe sent by the European Space Agency into a suicide landing onto the 
the alien moon. The sounds are absolutely far out. It starts with a beating and then some interstabbing robotic sounds. Listen. And I went off the deep end. Ed Kemper has been serving a life sentence in this California. Then, well, whatever this is, buzzing, brain numbing, buzzing. At age 15. I would have killed until they gunned me down. I wouldn't have been able to reason my way out. What do you think? Can you deal with that? Okay, this is where it gets awful. It reaches into a crescendo where you think your brain will explode. And I did it in my society. Seriously, stop Titan, stop this, Titan's kicking off. You may want to couple this sound with images taken from Titan 2, together they're quite the intergalactic horror story. Starting off our list at our number 10 spot, we have the beginning. Let's start at the beginning of when we began to speculate that there may be life on Mars. If you didn't know, Mars has polar ice caps and those were first discovered in the 17th century. In the late 18th century, a scientist named William Herschel proved that the ice caps grew and shrunk, but were alternating based on the summer and winter each hemisphere was in. From there, astronomers began to realize all of the other similarities that Mars has to Earth, such as a very similar length of day, a similar axial tilt, and the fact that Mars was clearly experiencing sea seasons, albeit twice the length of Earth's. This all led scientists to speculate that there may be alien life living on the planet because it has all of these similarities to our incredibly hospitable Earth. Maybe Mars would be equally as great of a host for life. Way back then, it was theorized that there may possibly be advanced alien life, which we now know is not the case, but that doesn't mean that there is no alien life at all or that life on Mars never existed. In our number 9 spot today we have the Viking 1. We can now move along to the first lander on Mars which occurred in 1976 and was NASA's Viking 1 lander. This was a huge step in the process of exploring and searching for life on Mars and it all started with the search for water, specifically liquid water. Water has been found on other planets in our solar system but it is not normally found in liquid form due to the extreme environments and atmospheres that exist in space and on other planets. The Viking 1 was able to give us pretty solid evidence that led scientists to believe that there had once been liquid water on Mars and it seemed as though it had rained. While Mars certainly isn't currently a planet that would be hospitable to human life, what the Viking 1 gave researchers was evidence that the planet probably once was very hospitable for life and the rain would mean that the planet once had a thicker atmosphere, which means that while it may not be currently holding life, there is the possibility that it once was and may even still in the smallest, earliest way. In our number 8 spot today we have the Martian elements. Another thing that the Viking 1 was able to prove to scientists other than the existence of the ancient riverbeds and the evidence of vast flooding was that the planet held all of the elements that are essential for us to live here on Earth. These elements are the ones like carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus, just to name a few. This is of course a huge step because discoveries like these give scientists the ability to decide on what the next steps would be in the search for life. After this discovery, the Viking landers were able to perform some experiments on the Martian soil which did end up leading to some controversial results. The soil sample did test positive for metabolism which most definitely could be a positive sign of some sort of microorganism life but there are also other reasons which could be responsible for this positive test. While it would be nice to just jump to the conclusion that we've successfully found life on Mars, it is imperative that our scientists remain skeptical and don't take this one experiment as a sure sign. In our number 7 spot today we have ALH84001. On December 27th, 1984, a piece of Mars was actually found on Earth. This meteorite was found in the Allen Hills in Antarctica and it is believed that it started off on Mars, of course, and was thought to have crystallized from molten rock around 4 billion years ago. Scientists believe that it came barreling to Earth after an ancient collision only to be found by some American meteor hunters. The rock was named ALH84001 and it weighed around 4 pounds and of course testing was done on it immediately because this is believed to be the oldest Martian rock we have ever found on Earth. In 1996, while scientists were looking into the rock, they found structures in the meteorite that seemed similar to what would be formed by microbes as well as the presence of organic materials. There have, like many other potential signs of life on Mars, been scientists who have come up with other possible explanations for the structures that were found, and there are some scientists who believe that the organic material came from contamination with Earth materials, but truthfully, either theory could be correct. 
In our number six spot today, we have Curiosity. Now we are back on Mars with the Curiosity rover and its major discovery. Well, we already talked about the discovery of the traces of sulfur, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and carbon. Curiosity found the presence of minerals like sulfates and sulfides. This was an important discovery because it means that if life once existed, these minerals could have been utilized by the ancient microbes that may have once or possibly do still exist. This discovery led scientists to hypothesize that if there were primitive microbes, they may have found the minerals as a source of sufficient energy by feeding on the Martian rocks. These minerals also showed that when there was liquid water on Mars, the chemical composition of it would have been fine for us as humans to drink, which is another important factor when determining how hospitable a planet is. In our number 5 spot today, we have Martian cauliflower. We are now getting closer to where we are at in our current search for life on Mars, but we're still a few years behind with a discovery made by the Spirit rover in 2008. As Spirit was searching the red planet, it found a strange shape that was sticking out of the Gusev crater. This weird little shaped thing was nicknamed cauliflower because of its strange shape and appearance, but of course it isn't even close to being actual cauliflower. Images were of course taken of this, which showed that it contained a series of mineral deposits made up of opaline silica. This was super important because on Earth, these kinds of silica deposits are often in association with microbial activity. The skepticism with this one comes because of how different Mars current atmosphere is from Earth's. So we have to understand that this could have been caused by something as simple as wind erosion, which is a non-biological process. But just because we have to remain skeptical and question all angles doesn't mean that this doesn't point to signs of Martian bacteria. In our number 4 spot today we have Mars past. Before we get into the most recent discoveries, just to do our due diligence, we should definitely talk about the history of Mars because like we've talked about a bit already today, in its current state, it most definitely doesn't seem like a place where life could thrive. Currently, Mars is cold and dry and can reach temperatures of minus 140 degrees Celsius, which even as a Canadian, I can admit is a little too cold. The atmosphere of Mars is also currently far too thin to protect the planet from the ultraviolet radiation from space, which would be more than enough to kill any kind of life that we know of here on Earth. But because of all the exploration we've done throughout the years, along with some of the discoveries we've discussed today, we now know that Mars was not always like this. Mars is just as old as Earth is, which means there's been tons and tons of time for the planet to change. The lake beds we found show that the water was once flowing there, despite that not being the case currently. Astronomers say that there is reason to believe that Mars' atmosphere was once filled with carbon dioxide, which traps heat and in turn would have caused a greenhouse effect and warmed the planet to a temperature more conducive to life. Because of the age of Mars, there would have been millions, if not billions, of years where the planet was both warm and wet, which is the perfect combination for emerging life. When the Martian conditions turned cold and nasty, it is possible that this may have led to the extinction of the life that may have once existed, which would have left fossils behind. Or just maybe there is still the presence of life just under the surface of the red planet. This is why, while we know advanced, civilized aliens aren't walking around on the planet, we have to continue our search. In our number 3 spot today, we have potential contamination. With all of our missions to Mars, one thing that is extremely important before the rovers take off on their long journey is decontamination. Any kind of contamination from our planet could greatly skew the results of all of the searches and experiments, so of course there are extreme processes that take place before takeoff. This doesn't mean it hasn't happened though. This is just another reason on the long list of why it is always imperative to remain skeptical. What if we found evidence of life on Mars only to later find out that it came from us. The good news is that it is highly unlikely that any organisms from Earth could survive in that kind of a harsh climate, but we certainly cannot bank on that. In our number 2 spot today we have methane. Ok, we are back on our timeline of Martian discoveries that might point to signs of life. Now we are at a point just a few years ago in 2018 when the Curiosity rover found evidence of the presence of methane in the Martian air. It has been hypothesized from other observations from rovers and orbiters that methane may be present, but Curiosity was the first to give us the evidence we needed. This methane discovery is important because on Earth, methane is considered an indication of life, but it is volatile and doesn't 
doesn't last for very long because it quickly breaks down into other molecules. This of course means that there must be something producing the methane that we've been able to find. We also discovered that the methane on Mars goes up and down which suggests to scientists that it's being produced by living organisms. This isn't, like everything else on this list, a conclusive finding to prove that life on Mars exists, but it is another reason for us to just continue. In our number one spot today we have perseverance. Okay, we are finally at our most recent exploration with the extremely cool and exciting Perseverance rover which landed on the planet on February 18th of this year. Perseverance is set to have the largest search for life on the planet that we have ever seen and this is due to both the past explorations and discoveries as well as technological advancements. I mean, we can now see pictures of Mars in 4K. How wild is that? One of Perseverance's main objectives is to search the Jezero Crater. This crater is 28 miles wide and 1,600 feet deep and is located just a bit north of the Martian equator. This crater is obviously huge but very important in our search because it is thought to have once housed a lake that would have dried up around 3.5 billion years ago. This has led it to be basically a perfect spot for the rover to look for ancient signs of life and microorganisms that may have once lived in the water. Not only will Perseverance conduct its own experiments, but it will also store samples of rocks for its future return mission to Earth. While this hasn't yet provided us with any signs that may point to life, the potential future findings are very exciting. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have radiation proof bacteria. In 2002, Russian astrobiologists hypothesized that a bacteria here on Earth may have actually evolved on Mars. Dionychus radioduranus is the most tough bacteria on Earth. It can withstand even the most extreme conditions such as cold, dehydration, vacuum, and acid, but the craziest part is that it is virtually radiation proof. These little microbes can withstand several thousand times the amount of radiation a human can withstand, as well as more radiation than any other bacteria on Earth. You can even find this bacteria on the inside of a nuclear reactor. Scientists did an experiment to see how quickly this bacteria could build up a stronger radiation resistance by zapping the bacteria with enough radiation to kill 99.9% .9 of it, and then leaving the remaining 0.01% to repopulate before zapping it again and repeating repeating the process. It was concluded that it would have taken E. coli thousands and thousands of rounds to build up the same resistance that this hardy bacteria did in only 44 rounds. With this experiment and based on the dose of radiation they gave each bacteria, it would take millions and millions of years to get even close to that amount of radiation they gave the bacteria in one cycle. Since Earth just doesn't carry that amount of radiation, it has led some scientists to speculate that since Mars is virtually unprotected and receives extremely high amounts of radiation, these bacteria may have evolved on Mars and gained their resistance in just a few hundred thousand years, and that they may have been flung off of Mars by an asteroid and then brought to Earth on meteorites. It certainly is just a hypothesis at this point, but really, how else can we explain this random super-powered bacteria that is unlike anything else on our Earth? In our number 9 spot today, we have the USS Princeton UFO. What's a space list without the mention of a UFO sighting? This one took place in 2004. On November 14th of that year, the USS Princeton noticed an unknown aircraft of some sort that was about 100 miles off the coast of San Diego. For two weeks prior to this, the crew had been tracking a strange flying object that was starred out at around 80,000 feet before extremely quickly dropping to hover right above the Pacific Ocean. Black Aces Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Jim Slate of Strike Fighter Squadron 41 went over in two fighter jets in order to kind of scope out the situation, and when they arrived, they saw what at first appeared to be churning water, while there was an oval shape just below the surface. After this, a white oval shaped object appeared above the water, but it had no markings on it. Like we're talking no windows, nothing that would indicate an engine, no wings, and the infrared monitors on the jets didn't pick up any sort of exhaust. The commander and lieutenant commander tried to intercept this strange aircraft, but it very quickly flew away and reappeared on the monitor 60 miles away. Like when I say quickly, I mean it was moving at three times the speed of sound and over twice the speed of the fighter jets. Like some Top Gun Maverick stuff. So faster than any kind of technology we currently have. We still don't know exactly what this was, but I'll tell you one thing. We definitely don't have that kind of technology. 
In our number eight spot today, we have the USO. UFO to USO. Daryl Miklos is an explorer who took a deep dive following maps that had been put together by his friend and former astronaut, Gordon Cooper. The map Daryl was using was initially made to help identify more than 100 magnetic anomalies in the sea. During one dive at a location within the Bermuda Triangle, where everything weird happens, he thought he was going to find an ancient shipwreck, but instead he found something that continues to stump researchers and Daryl himself. He came across a very strange structure that wasn't like anything he had seen before. This structure had long obtrusions which stuck out from the sides, and the whole thing was covered in coral, so whatever it is, it has been down there for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Daryl has said, quote, There's identical formations in three different areas, and they don't look nature-made. They don't look man-made. Certainly nothing I've ever seen based on my experience, and I have years of experience at doing this. We've identified multiple different types of shipwreck material. This doesn't match or look anything like that. People have started speculating that this structure may just be the remains of a crashed UFO. If it isn't that, then what else could it be? In our number seven spot today, we have the Antikythera Mechanism. The Antikythera Mechanism is an extremely mysterious discovery that has stumped researchers ever since it was found. This artifact was found 150 feet below the surface of the Aegean Sea in a shipwreck and it is the oldest kind of computer ever recorded, as it was dated back to the 7th century BCE. The author David Childress likened the finding to if they had found a jet plane in King Tut's tomb. That's how bizarre this discovery really was. Due to the complexity and oddity of the finding, alien enthusiasts have believed for quite some time that it may have been technology that was passed down from some sort of superior being. So. Aliens. When the artifact was recreated in order to learn about the mysteries it holds, the mechanism was able to calculate the position and running time of each planet. How would they have been able to create this without the use of sophisticated astronomical tools? I'm not saying that this is like concrete proof of alien life, but I don't know. There's just gotta be something else at play here. In our number six spot today, we have fossilized microbes. This is a piece of evidence that came from 1996, and it is said to have come all the way from Mars. 25 years ago, scientists said that they had potentially found what appeared to be fossilized microbes in a lump of Martian rock. This rock was hypothesized to have come off of Mars after some sort of collision that the planet had and then just casually floated around in space for some 15 million years before it ended up in Antarctica in 1984. You know, just the kind of thing that happens in space. Once the rock was found and analyzed, it was found that it contained organic molecules and small specks of mineralized magnetite, which can sometimes be found in the bacteria here on Earth. Once viewed with an electron microscope, there were signs of bacteria found. Of course, with anything like this, there will always be skeptics, and some have claimed that the magnetite wasn't that similar to those found in bacteria, and some claim that the signs of nanobacteria were just grown in a lab. I'm not a scientist. Scientist, nor have I seen this Mars rock, so I obviously can't tell you who is telling the truth here, but what I can say is that neither of the people who believe this rock came from Mars, or those who claim that it's fake, can prove their point without any kind of doubt, so... I'll just let you draw your own conclusions on this one. In our number five spot today, we have quark gluon plasma. So basically, scientists believe that right after the Big Bang, there was this sort of really hot, goopy kind of a substance that was created, and it was made up of all different kinds of matter. Everything is moving around at the speed of light, it's hot, it's fast, and it's like cosmic soup. Okay, so experts at the Large Hadron Collider, which is the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator, wanted to recreate this space soup. You know, part of the whole trying to solve the mysteries of the universe's origins kind of thing. When they did this and got the machine to recreate this, they ended up recording the highest temperature ever. Apparently this soup was measured at 9.9 .9 trillion degrees Fahrenheit. We obviously can all understand that that is insanely hot, but just how hot? Well, that is 366,000 times hotter than the center of the sun. In our number four spot today, we have energetic cosmic rays. Energetic cosmic rays are described as high energy protons and atomic nuclei that move through space at nearly the speed of light. There are some that originate from supernova, but there are some that originate from outside of our galaxy, and those ones have scientists wondering where they are coming from and what the source of them is. As these cosmic rays 
rays flow into our solar system, their paths are bent by the magnetic fields of both the Sun and the Earth. Upon impact with Earth's atmosphere, these rays produce a shower of secondary particles. Some of these particles do end up reaching Earth, but most are intercepted by either the magnetosphere or the heliosphere. The strongest cosmic rays are extremely powerful and they can have energies of over 100 million times greater than a man-made collider. If you're wondering why you should care about this space mystery, it's because these things have the power to cause our digital systems to crash, and in our ever-increasing digital world, that could cause some major disruptions to our life. That is why we care about how many of their origins remain a complete mystery that has scientists stumped. And also, because shouldn't we just know where these things that are bombarding Earth's atmosphere are coming from? Concerning is definitely the word I'd use, but honestly, what part of space isn't concerning? In our number 3 spot today, we have Elst Pizarro. This is a weird little object that has been stumping scientists since it was first discovered in 1979. So basically, asteroids and comets tend to be fairly easy to tell apart. I mean, an asteroid is a solid lump of rock and metal and you tend to find them more in the inner solar system, especially in the asteroid belt. And on the other hand, we have comets, which are usually more icy objects that travel from the outer areas of the solar system, and sometimes when they react with the solar radiation, they have those famous tails. So when Elst Pizarro was first discovered, it was orbiting in the asteroid belt, so it was classified as an asteroid. Flash forward to 1996 and closer examination shows that it had a tail like a comet. At first, experts thought that perhaps the tail was a result of some sort of collision, which is not uncommon for asteroids, but when the brightness and structure of the tail changed over time, it became clear that it was more of an ongoing process. Basically, this object showed signs and trademarks of both asteroids and comets, and it truly was a baffling discovery. Basically, the discovery of this object led to an entirely new classification active asteroids. In our number 2 spot today, we have the fastest black hole. The biggest black hole that we have found so far is said to weigh about 40 billion times the mass of our sun, or about 20 times the size of our solar system. That's so scary. That's so big! Some of the outer slowest orbiting planets in our solar system, like let's take Neptune as an example, orbits at a speed of about 165 Earth years. This huge black hole, the one that's 20 times the size of our solar system, yet it orbits once every 3 months. Do you know how fast that is? Neptune is considered slow at going 12,148 miles per hour. The outer edge of this black hole is moving at half the speed of light. The crazy thing about black holes this large though, other than how fast they're moving apparently, is that it is believed that they wouldn't necessarily kill you right away if you were to fall into one. In fact, it's thought that you would actually survive. You just wouldn't be able to escape to tell the tale because of that whole nothing escapes the black hole thing that they all have going on. In our number one one spot today we have supermassive black holes. Speaking of black holes, why is there a supermassive black hole at the center of most galaxies? We know that this is often the case, but we just can't quite figure out why. Every galaxy's supermassive black hole ranges in size, and we know that a stellar black hole forms from a supernova when the core of the star implodes, but we don't know how a supermassive black hole is formed. Because of the fact that the center of galaxies is where a lot of matter is boxed in, it could happen that supermassive black holes form from a cluster of regular stars black holes, which all ended up merging together because they were in a tight, confined space at the center of the galaxy. There are other theories as well, such as the possibility of these supermassive black holes being formed during the Big Bang. What I'm trying to get at is, we don't know how these things are formed, or why they are in the center of most galaxies, or even if there were supermassive black holes before the galaxies even existed. Maybe one day we'll find out, but this might just be one of those mysteries that is destined to stay a secret. Thank you.